When you hear this buzz, what first comes to mind? My guess is that most of you are immediately thinking about your fear of getting stung. Maybe those more optimistic among you are thinking about honey. I'm here to tell you about how bees can shed important light on our global sustainability challenges. I'm a professor here at American University, and most of my research is about sustainable development politics in the Brazilian Amazon. It's fascinating and important work to be researching how people can test and advocate for new conservation areas. But one of my consistent frustrations is that the Amazon is so far away from my own home. One of my main coping strategies involves trying to walk the talk of sustainability in my everyday practices. The personal is political, and after all, when you teach politics like I do, it's hard to escape that fact. So beekeeping has become one of my major coping mechanisms. I became a beekeeper by chance. In the spring of 2011, we had just finished a fancy new building on our campus, but we didn't have enough money left over in the budget to put a green roof on top. Instead, I got a $400 grant to throw a beehive up on the roof. That was Beyonce. I really quickly got a crash course in urban beekeeping and quickly became obsessed with all things bees. It was not just the techniques of beekeeping that I was learning. I began to think about the roles that bees play in our global agricultural systems, in rural poverty alleviation, in global trade disputes, and also how beekeeping could function as a part of sustainability education. Those are the things that I'm here to tell you about today. And I hope that by the end of my talk, when you hear that buzzing sound, you won't have so much fear of bees and moreover, that you'll be thinking about sustainability in a new way too. That's a lot of ground to cover. So let's make like honeybees and waggle dance into the sticky details. Bees are an ancient symbol of life, death, and reincarnation. They're a fascinating historical subject. We see them in cave paintings. We see them in Egyptian hieroglyphics. And in modern times, we've domesticated the honeybee. As pollinators, Bees play a crucial role in our global food systems. We have bred bees, mostly from Italy and Russia, to withstand our climate variations here in North America, and also because they play uh, an important role in honey production and in food production. Bees, in fact, account for about one third of the fruit and vegetables and nuts that we eat. This is what our grocery store shelves look like, thanks to bees. It's a $15 billion industry every year, uh, the services that bees provide from crop pollination. In our world without bees, this is what our store shelves would look like. So we need bees. They're essentially important for our global food production. And yet today, there are about half as many bee colonies in the United States as there were in 1947. During World War II, we provided incentives for our farmers to keep bees. Part of that was because bees' wax was useful in making airplanes more aerodynamic. Bees' wax also played a role in uh, munitions manufacturing. And on top of that, sugar was in, so in short supply. So we started thinking about beekeeping as a way to make our diets naturally sweeter. Remember that today, there's only 2.5 million bee colonies in the United States. Beekeepers are having hard times, both because of the industrialized food system, as well as because of the, the host of toxic cocktails that bees are exposed to through being trucked across the country as they're, as they're, as they're working as pollinators. So essentially, in our U.S. agricultural system, we truck bees from the south, where they pollinate our citrus crops, to California, where they pollinate almond fields, up to pollinate cherries in Washington state, across to Wisconsin to pollinate cranberry bogs, and into the northeast for the rest of our fruit production. That's pretty stressful if you're a bee. And on top of that, we've hurt all pollinators by destroying a lot of our wild habitat. So things like monarch butterflies and solitary bees, 
which are also really important to our global food production, are incredibly under threat. There's a lot behind this problem. And for the time being, I'd like you to imagine what our system could look like if we offered more incentives for beekeepers to be able to, to, to work without such an industrial set of necessities. What if there was more training for beekeeping in commercial agricultural operations? What if there was more habitat available for our wild pollinators? Our fields might be buzzing again. It's hard work being a beekeeper. It's, it's so hard, in fact, that many beekeepers are struggling just to get by. And on top of that, they're getting stung more often than other farmers. And as they struggle, one of the leading factors of colony, uh, of colony losses is something called colony collapse disorder, or CCD. You've probably heard about it as the mysterious disease causing devastating losses to bee colonies all around the world. The Europeans looked at the science behind CCD, and a lot of the evidence pointed to one particular set of pesticides called neonicotinoid pesticides. They thought, neonicotinoids are probably connected to CCD, and so it's better to be safe than sorry. So what they did was put an outright ban on neonicotinoid use in their agricultural operations in 2013. The US looked at all the science out there on colony collapse and decided that there were a whole host of factors that were causing bees to die off. Not only were they being trucked across the country, but on top of that, there were viruses like Nosema, Varroa mites, American fowl brood, and a host of other chemicals that bees were exposed to that could be responsible for the colony losses that we were experiencing. So the EPA decided not to regulate neonicotinoid pesticides. Their approach ultimately involved looking at all the science and then wringing their hands and deciding that what we call the precautionary principle should not apply. Now, this is a global question of risk regulation in our agricultural system. This is beyond the challenge of protecting domestic pollination, but one where we see coming to light a question of how pesticides ought to be regulated and the possible implications on our global food system. Because in Europe, what happened after this ban is not, in fact, that we saw a significant increase in the number of bee colonies, as those advocating for the ban might have expected. Instead, older pesticides were used in heavier quantities on a lot of European farms. And so pests that had been uh, developing resistances to some of these pesticides are now coming back. Flea beetles have severely affected rapeseed oil production in Europe. This means rapeseed is basically canola oil. So it means that there are higher vegetable oil and biodiesel prices that the whole global food ch chain is affected by. Now, I'd like you to imagine a world where we don't have to make these choices between higher food prices, pollinator protection, and agricultural productivity. It is possible to imagine that world. And the implications of imagining that world and transforming business practices and regulations so that we can make that world possible are significant to all of us. We might also look at the role that beekeeping and beekeepers have in poverty alleviation. When we think about sustainable agriculture, rural beekeeping is something that can make a big difference in the lives of the poorest of the poor. Here I'm not talking about our commercial agricultural systems, but rather about farming that happens in rural Uganda, in Ethiopia, in Pakistan, in Brazil, in Cambodia. $200 per year, thanks to a little extra honey being sold in your markets, or some candles that you make from beeswax, can make a real difference in the lives of the poor. It can mean that a, a child can get a school, an education or other experiences that they wouldn't otherwise have. You're not gonna see this honey on the shelves of your local Whole Foods that the, the revenue from exports just don't make it worthwhile. But we can think about beekeeping in this light as a rural development approach. It takes hard work 
capacity building, a lot of training, a small amount of money, but considerable capacity building efforts to make beekeeping operations and rural livelihoods successful. And yet, this is an important piece of the puzzle. It's not very high profile work, but it certainly is part of the answer towards making agriculture more sustainable and addressing poverty alleviation. It's a win-win. I've covered some of the supply side, so now let's turn to the demand side of issues concerning bees and people. It's about an issue as sticky as honey itself, global trade. So American consumers love honey. In fact, we need about 60% of the honey that we consume to come from other countries because our domestic beekeepers only produce about 140 or 150 million pounds of honey per year, and our demand is more like 400 million pounds. So the only problem with importing honey is that not all actors within our free market system are honest. Chinese honey, in fact, is thought to be contaminated both with antibiotic residues and oftentimes adulterated with corn syrup or other artificial sweeteners. The problem is when honey laundering happens. So we have a situation in the US where in one of the biggest cases of illegal dumping to ever happen, the Immigrations and, and Customs Afor Enforcement Agency, or ICE, busted the two largest domestic honey producers in, in the US for trade fraud. They had marketed this funny honey from China as if it was from other places. Now this was a scam, a global trade fraud of global proportions. The honey coming from China had been transshipped through other Asian countries and then falsely labeled in the US markets and was sold for ridiculously low prices. Now this has implications not only for those of you concerned with food purity, but also for jobs and for our overall economic security. Regulating trade is an issue that goes beyond honey as a sort of sweet metaphor for the things that are, are most uh, delightful in life. In fact, we should think about honey not just as a metaphor, but as a commodity that can shed important light on how we regulate trade and how we cope with interdependent global food systems. I've covered supply and demand, so I'd like to wrap up by sharing a personal experience. Soon after I began beekeeping at American University, students, faculty, and staff alike caught the buzz. I started a beekeeping club on campus together with some students, and we've installed two hives on the green roof of our student union building. The hives, by the way, are called Game of Drones and Susan B. Anthony. <laughs> it's really grounding to work with the bees. It's intense, and it takes a lot of focus to work with so many little, fast-moving insects that could sting you. But we're learning through the Beekeeping Society not only about what nature is doing at any given point of time, but also about how to set our own learning goals and how to collaborate across our many interdisciplinary uh, approaches to learning. So Eli, a biology major, held up his first bee frame of bees in his freshman year and thought, wow, I think I want to go pursue a career in bee genetics. Lauren, a communications student, made a short film about the bees, and she's now going on to pursue a master's degree in wildlife and environmental filmmaking. Our, our business majors are figuring out ways to market our lip balm. Our anthropology majors are studying the beekeepers themselves. <laughs> and together, we're learning about how to collaborate, how to think on our feet, and also about the globally interconnected challenges of food systems, human relationships with the nat natural world, and also, of course, about how to keep the bees alive. 
And it's often been sad and frustrating because it's actually really hard to be a good beekeeper. All sorts of stuff can happen. The winters are really cold in our climate and the bees don't naturally just stay alive. So we're figuring out that not only do we need bees, but they need us. And through that sense of understanding that our experience with the bees goes beyond just the pot of honey or more bountiful vegetable gardens, we're developing a sense of empathy. We're learning together, not just with our heads, but with our hearts and our hands. And that's a lot of what sustainability education is all about. It's about thinking of the human relationships to the natural world as being totally interdependent upon one another. And when we approach sustainability through that light, we not only can learn to collaborate and to think on our feet, but also to appreciate our relationship to the natural world in a deeper way. So today I've told you about agricultural productivity, about pesticide regulation, about rural livelihoods, about trade, and even about sustainability education. And through beekeeping, we can understand all of those phenomena. Bees are more than just the proverbial canary in the coal mine in teaching us about how those systems are going haywire. These are complex issues, but bees, because they are intermediaries, show us how these systems are interconnected with each other. They move between the systems, both through their pollination and through their products. On top of this, bees show us that we can be hopeful about the sustainability challenges in the world. By keeping the bees alive, we can learn that not only can we make the world more vital, more bountiful, more productive, but also we can figure out ways together to make this world a little bit sweeter. Thank you.